you. Let me invite everyone to stand. Stand in this morning. In the first slide, we'll be singing about the greatness of God. And let us read from Psalm 147, 5 through 7. How great is our God. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. The Lord supports the humble, but he brings the wicked down into the dust. Sing out your thanks to the Lord. Sing praises to our God with a harp. As we sing about the greatness of God, his greatness can be mighty in power and strength, but also in his caring towards his people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and his caring so much that he sent his son to come down on the cross and cover all of our sins. And that's what we sing about this morning.
Out in the uh, lobby, there are different uh, signs along the back wall based on the parable of the sower. And one says, amongst the uh, uh, path, amongst the uh, rocky places, amongst the thorns, and then the last one says, but on the good soil. It shows the different places the seed fell. And of course, when Sunday morning comes, I normally get myself right at the table right back there and so I can look on in. But then I looked up and saw the sign I sat in front of said, Among the Thorns. And I wasn't really sure if that was a character statement or what, but uh, it talks about how the gospel strikes people differently and in different places. And uh, reading briefly from part of that parable, it says, Jesus said, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, where it was trampled on, the birds ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came time, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And when he had said this, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Regarding the thorns, 
just like the rock and just like the path, that's a specific place in the field. It's not like there's a seed thrown out and a thorn happens to come up next to it. Back in those days, farmers did not mind at all having thorns near their crop as long as it was on the perimeter. The thorny plants kept critters out, kept predators out, kept thieves out. Uh, growing on up, there was a cattle uh, pasture right next to our place. And a person built a fence and then they planted berry vines. After a while, you could not tell that there was a fence there, but the berry vines did a very good job keeping everything else out of the pasture and the, and the uh, cattle in. The thorns were on the perimeter. So the seed that fell near the thorns were the ones near the edge. The ones that were in God's will, but just barely, right? Whereas we know in general, God calls us to the middle of his will, to focus on him. I've described this before about the table, the Lord's Supper and the table. If you're in the middle, you're pretty safe, right? Even if you were to fall over, you're still on the table. But if you're on the perimeter, just barely there, and you fall, chances are it's a tragic fall. And communion is one of those things that calls us away from the perimeter, away from barely being what you're supposed to be, to the core, to the center, to the focus, what Jesus Christ calls you to be, a disciple of his. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, help us to focus. We live amongst so many throughout our culture that just barely want to qualify for whatever. Lord, we want you. We want core relationship with you, simplicity with you, you. Lord, help us in this communion time to see that in our quest. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I encourage you to take your communion. Tearing back the top layer brings the bread, which represents Christ's body. And then the second tab for the te cup, for the juice that represents Christ's blood.
you for being with us. Be with us as we uh, accept your word. Trinity Christian Fellowship, I want you to know I love you with all my heart. And let's stay in love with one another and our fellow man. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven, we come to you as people in a place and a time in which people are bouncing off the walls in all sorts of different respects, Lord. And uh, we do not know always what has come over us, Lord, but we want your Holy Spirit to come over us. And we want the peace that surpasses all understanding from Philippians chapter 2 to be guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Help us to be good brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to be good citizens, good neighborhood companions. And Lord, help us to be a people of prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Turning your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 52, we're going to be focusing primarily on verses 7, 8, and 9 but referencing other places. Well, Isaiah 52, I call this one pinball headache. If any of you remember how you used to play pinball and uh, you'd launch a ball by pulling the little plunger and it'd be bouncing back and forth and making all sorts of noise, ding, 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 bong, bong, you know, and so forth. And the, the toll will go up. You're just standing there, but you're not sure exactly why the points are good one place, but not another. Then eventually the ball comes down to your flippers and you'd hit the buttons and keep it going until eventually it comes perfectly right down the middle and neither flipper hits it. And then that ball or that game is over. In many respects, it seems to me that a lot of things that go on in our world nowadays are kind of at pinball pace, right? conversations, activity, news issues, uh, things that just come and go back and forth. You're not sure exactly the point value of each thing, but there's just a lot of things bouncing off the wall. And uh, calling this pinball headache because chapter 52 of Isaiah is kind of like a pinball headache. In many respects, I could call it, let me explain, scatterbrained. Okay, now, Brained as far as it has a lot to say. It is divine. It is scripture scattered because it touches a whole bunch of things all over the place. And if I were to ask you, you know, what do you think of Isaiah 52? If you had read it, you'd say, uh, nice chapter, beautiful chapter. And then if I were to ask you, what does it mean? You'd say, can I read it again first? And then go through and it bounces all over the place. As far as time-wise, sometimes it's talking about Isaiah's time. Sometimes it's talking about 120 years later during the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity. Then it's other places. It's talking about like 70 years later during the exile. Sometimes later it's talking about the Messiah. Sometimes it's addressing people in Jerusalem. Sometimes it's addressing people in Babylon. Sometimes it's addressing people at the ends of the earth. Uh, It has four different times in which it has verses that are quoted in the New Testament. One of those we're going to cover, but the other three, I look at those, and then I look at the quote that Paul uses from there, and I scratch my head, and I kind of say, you know, Paul, I see you're using that verse, but to tell you the truth, I really don't see the connection. Now, in that case, you trust Paul, not me, because he's inspired. I'm not, right? But still, it's an odd chapter. What makes it even odd, more odd, is that the chapter right after it, Isaiah 53, has got to be one of the most beautiful, coherent passages in all of Scripture. Basically, if you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and turned it into a poem, that would be Isaiah 53. It's awesome. Isaiah 52 bounces off the walls. Like a lot of things go on. And so anyway, I look at a core of verses right in the middle of it, and it kind of gives us a beautiful clue as to where our brains should be and what our life should be like during pinball headaches when everything is bouncing all over everything. The first one of those things in verse 7 is to be beautiful. 
be beautiful. Verse 7 says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Okay? You want to have beautiful feet? It says here, beautiful feet belong to the person who brings good news. The, the setting is kind of looking forward to the future when Babylon has already destroyed Jerusalem, taken the citizens away to Babylon, and then it's time for the Israelites to come back. And there's just a few people in the ghost town of Jerusalem, which is all in ruins. And then they see a messenger come and standing on the hills around Jerusalem. And that person says, you're going to get a redo. You are going to be made brand new. Everything is going to be restored. It's going to be awesome. Now, that's good news, saying good news that people are actually waiting for. This passage is quoted once in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, in the context of sharing the gospel and uh, developing faith. And it says this, And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's, that's our verse. Verse 16, But not all the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? That's actually the first line of the next chapter that we're covering next week. Verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. The thing about being beautiful is to be long awaited good news from God. Be mobile news, because that's what you have feet for. You're able to take the good news from one place to another. And when it underscores what kind of good news this is, another word for good news is gospel, but it describes it in five ways, and they're all beautiful things. Good news, peace, good tidings, salvation, and saying God reigns. All those are beautiful, wonderful, lovely things. Now, I remember when I first became a pastor, first few years, even up to maybe the first five years of pastoring here, and I'd be periodically get somebody who or tell me, you know what the church needs more? We need more hellfire and brimstone sermons so people can get scared into loving God. And uh, my response was always the same. I believe in preaching hellfire and brimstone. I will preach in hellfire and brimstone every time I come across it in the word of God. But for some people, they want more hellfire and brimstone than even the Bible puts out. And uh, I can't guarantee on that. But here, it says, when you go to these beaten down, desperate people who are sitting in ruins, you're not preaching hellfire and brimstone, right? You go to the mountains around Jerusalem and you say, Israelites, you're going to hell. And what would the response be maybe? Well, tell us when we're there because we might not notice, right? When somebody's down, you make the good news gospel awesome and great. You lift them up. In Titus chapter 2, verse 10, in this section is talking about how a slave in the Roman Empire is supposed to witness to his master. Now, you talk about an odd group to try to witness to. And it says this, Titus chapter 2, verse 10 but show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Attractive. The Greek word for attractive in that translation is cosmeo. Cosmetics. It's saying give a facial to the doctrine about God. Wait, isn't God beautiful enough? Yeah, but for some people... <laughs> It needs a little bit of a touch-up. Honestly, are not there Christians who have made God look a little bit scarier or more horrible to the non-plessed observer? It can happen so often. In verse 5, we didn't read it from this chapter, but it is quoted one place in the New Testament in Romans chapter 2, verse 24. And in that passage, uh, verse 5 talks about the Gentiles blaspheming God. The application of it in Romans 2 is that the Gentiles are blaspheming God because of God's people who are hypocritical. 
And the question for us is, okay, maybe we are not necessarily the biggest evangelists and spreading the love of God everywhere. But the flip side question is, but are we scaring people away from God? Kind of the rule of thumb, if you're not going to bring them in, that's how it, ha- how it happens sometimes. But at least don't scare anybody away, right? Be beautiful. That's number one. Number two, believe what you see. That's the second point we have in verse eight. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Okay? So it's talking about here when the Lord returns. Now, in some respects, maybe it's talking about when the Israelites are coming back from Babylon. There's going to be a time in which they're going to see the people who are sitting in ghost town Jerusalem is going to see people coming home. That's going to be cool. A second thought of when it means the Lord's going to come is when Jesus came here to earth. And it's interesting. Remember the man Simeon, who was in the temple, and he blessed Jesus on day eight after Jesus' birth. And he sang a song in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 29. And and it says this, Sovereign Lord, just as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, that was from last week's sermon, and glory to your people Israel. Simeon is saying, I got to see it with my own two eyes. Everybody, the Gentiles, are going to see it with their own two eyes. Not just words about Jesus coming. There are plenty of those. You believe what you can see. It has to come eventually. It has to be real at some point. Later on, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about the second coming. Oftentimes people say, oh, you know, there's this sign and this sign and the other sign. Sure, there are signs that will precede his coming. But I say, I know when Jesus is going to be coming back. When I look on up and say, hey, there he is. I mean, I know that's hyper simplistic, but it's pretty accurate, right? But in Matthew chapter 24, verse, starting with verse 26, Jesus says, so if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out or here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's saying, uh, don't worry so much about the talk. Uh-uh. It's what you see, like the lightning that goes from horizon to horizon. That is what you can trust. You know, the old phrase, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. That is kind of the thrust here because there are so many things that are words out there. Lord is not a secretive individual. Um, we need to really approach things by what we see happening. There have been lots of people who've had rough goes in life, you know, and they say how Lord has changed their life. And in the back of my mind, I'm saying, when your life changes, my ears are not going to notify me. My eyes will notify me when your life has changed. Anybody can say stuff, right? It's whether they actually do or not. Um, And the thing is important in this is that desperate people are suckers for rumors, right? Suckers for gossip. If you're sick with a horrible disease that the doctors really can't do too much about, you're there on the internet, you're looking for any bit of hope you can, right? You know, is there a steady group over here? There's a new diet over there. There's a new treatment over there, so forth. You're looking for anything that can give you a glimmer of hope and you're searching anywhere for any rumor that might give you something. The same type of thing if you're, let's say, a refugee and you're looking for a place to live in another country and you hear, oh, there's food over here. So they all stampede there. Oh, there's a new development over there. They stampede over there. Oh, there's a, they're handing out visas over here. Oh, they're stamping over here. And just like the pinball chasing after or the old dog chasing after the woodpecker in the forest, right? Hopping from tree to tree to tree, pinballing their way through life. Oftentimes the other people that are, uh, vulnerable or the unemployed. Oh, I heard they're hiring at this place. <laughs> no, but they might be over there. <laughs> and before you know it, again, the pinball action. The Lord is telling us if we're desperate, if we're going through hardship, the best thing oftentimes is to turn the ears off. Turn the rumors off, turn the gossip off, turn the fault, and go by what is reality. Now, that may not be as fun as what you hear. 
but it makes you more solid in your living out your life. The last thing we have in verse 9, and that is to be joy amongst the ruins. Joy amongst the ruins. Verse 9. Burst into songs together, uh, songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. It talks about ruins singing songs of joy, which is an odd concept to me. Oftentimes, if you see a movie in which, let's say it's a World War II and the whole village has been bombed out and, you know, people are just kind of walking around like zombies and maybe going, looking through the bricks for this or that, and they're, they're numb. Maybe they survive, but it's a numb experience. But here we're told about how the ruins are singing songs of joy. And when I was thinking this through, it gave me an odd mental picture. Um, and I'm, even though I shouldn't, I'm going to share it with you. Um, I remember when I was a kid in the 60s and then the 70s, there were youth choirs that would go around singing songs of happy joy, like Up With People, right? Or the Continental Singers and different ones that would sing happy songs. I like to teach the world to sing, you know, that type of thing. And it's so happy and there's so joy. But then I thought, okay, songs of joy, but those young people are way too happy. How do you have ruins singing happy? And so I did the Halloween thing. I turned it into a zombie choir. You know, up, up with people. You see them wherever you go. And, and it's an odd thought. How do you have joy and ruins at the same time? And it's not easy. It is absolutely not easy. But in this section, we have the thing that there is the culture of the ruin. The culture of the ruin says there are scores to settle right? This, uh, there is vengeance to be had. There are wrongs that we have suffered. There is bitterness that is in my heart. There is phobias that I'm wrestling with. There are past pains and blah, blah, blah. And to be one of those ruins, one of those people that have been devastated, but you say, I refuse to sing the song in the same tune that everybody else is singing at this time. I will be a person who sings. I will be a person who who has hope. I will be a person who has joy. I will not be a person who overreacts. I will not be a person who is banging off the wall. I will be not giving in to anger or phobia or pressure or anything. I will be a ruin that sings songs of joy. Will it be easy? Of course it won't. But still the Christian is called to be that person who is singing joy in the ruins. And the thing is that that is a picture of solidness, of stability. There's always going to be in that pinball scenario another rubber band <laughs> to bounce off of, another little bell, another little whistle to set off. But to be solid and saying, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm in the ruins, but I will have hope. I will sing joy. I will be counterculture to all the sound that's around me. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, help us to be solid people during this pinball time. Lord, keep us solid. Keep us reliable. Keep us to be solid to our friends, our family, to our fellow believers. Lord, make us to be people that are totally holding on to the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.